Trade Secrets is brought to you by Ruder Ware, business attorneys for business success, and by the Judd S. Alexander Foundation, supporting quality of life and economic development in Marathon County. Hi, I'm Stuart Etten, president of Ruder Ware Law Firm. Without businesses, communities would not thrive. And without communities, businesses wouldn't, well, have a place to do business. At Ruder Ware Law Firm, we've been providing counsel to Wisconsin business leaders and been a big part of our community for generations. So you could say we know a little bit about what it takes for the two to work together. That's why we're honored to present Trade Secrets here on Wisconsin Eye. It's a new series that shares candid conversations between successful Wisconsin business leaders and lets you, the audience, in on what it takes to cultivate both business and community in our great state. From Ruder Ware, thanks for watching and enjoy the show. One CEO travels to a company to meet another CEO and gets a tour. They talk business, challenges, share stories. Then the host CEO travels to another company, meets the new CEO, gets the tour. They talk business, challenges, share stories. Then we do it all over again. You get the picture. A chain of CEOs traveling around the state, meeting each other, talking business, sharing stories. That's Trade Secrets, CEO to CEO. Hi, I'm Dan Weinfurter. I'm your host for a new Wisconsin Eye business series. I'm an author, a serial entrepreneur, and currently a consultant who helps clients devise strategies for driving profitable growth. We're here in Wisconsin today to meet with Peter Harkin of Harkin Inc. Now you may think you don't know anything about Harkin, but you may be surprised. Today we're meeting Peter at the company headquarters in Pewaukee, Wisconsin. One of the questions I have for Peter is why, with offices in 50 locations, literally across the globe, manufacturing in both the United States and in Italy, would he choose to locate the company headquarters here in Pewaukee? So let's go ask Peter. But first, let me give you a little bit of background in the history of Harkin Inc. This year's America's Cup race offered the biggest comeback in sailing history. The Oracle team was down 8-1 when the big turnaround came about, and Oracle then won eight straight races to take the trophy. Now, what does an international racing yacht competition have to do with a manufacturer headquartered in the middle of a Wisconsin cornfield? Most of the sailboats competing in the America's Cup are outfitted with blocks, pulleys, hydraulics, winches, leads, and cleats that are engineered and manufactured by Harkin, Inc. And just as the Oracle team staged a remarkable comeback this year, the Harkin family made their own comeback over a half century ago. Founding brothers Peter and Olaf Harkin were born in Indonesia, but during the Japanese invasion of the islands in World War II, the boys and their mother escaped and made their way to the United States. Peter's father stayed behind with the Dutch resistance, only to be captured. He survived the prison camps amazingly and was reunited with his family in San Francisco in 1946. With an affinity for swimming and sailing, Peter tinkered with the design and manufacture of sailboat gear while working his way through the University of Wisconsin. The invention that put Harkin on the map was a block, like a pulley, with plastic circulating bearings. Word of the innovation spread within the sailing industry, especially after two sailors won gold medals with Harkin equipment in the 1968 Olympics. Harkin no longer builds boats, but concentrates instead on being a premier manufacturer of sailing components, as well as providing custom equipment for NASA, archaeological expeditions, and jet fighters, with an eye on finding engineering solutions to problems yet known. Hello, Peter. Hi there. there. So this is quite a place. What are we looking at right here? Well, we are uh, here in what we call our custom division section. So this is where we make all the America's Cup equipment, 
and uh, other big boat race equipment. And Harkett had something to do with the success of America's Cup of Oracle? We were very heavily involved. Uh, we were their uh, main supplier of equipment. Basically what we do is we build the control mechanisms that is the inner interface between the sailor and the boat. It's all the control mechanisms that adjust that adjusts the wing, that adjusts the foils, and so on. What's this uh, sailboat gear building company that does the sophisticated marine equipment and so on doing in the middle of a cornfield in the upper Midwest? Why Wisconsin and why here is really the, the people. I think the, the people of this area are the strongest, hardest working people on earth, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I think a company's success is completely due to its one real asset, and that's its people. And that's what we got here. We got 220 people in this plant, and, uh, and they're all, they're just great. You know, I, why I'm still coming to work every day. I love being with them and going down to the machine shop floor and around and talking with them all. Here we're making a stainless steel traveler car for a, for a mega yacht, like a 180 foot boat. Just a small boat. Yeah, just a small boat. Um, there's gonna be about 20 hours of machine time on this. It starts out as a five by five block of uh, 316 stainless steel. Uh, by the time it's done, it's all sculptured and contoured into a uh, basically a piece of art that has function, that has functionality, and that's what these customers are paying for. And we, we are known for uh, really good machining, being able to do a uh, short run, very fast, flexible, uh, which is what industry is calling for now. These guys have to be able to get on those computers first and first design it under a machining program uh, because they have to design every movement of the tool it makes. And that's not just one tool, there's a whole range of multiple cutting tools in this machine. You know, it's, it's interesting work. The guys have to, be, have to use their brains and then they have to use their hands, their technique to change the tools, get in there, do the machining and so on. I say the factory of today or the plant is very different from what so many people I think in our country perceive. As you can see, you can eat off this floor, everything is clean, the dirt is inside the machines and that's just chips and grease and stuff. Pat is one of the younger guys around here, most of the guys are old gray hairs like me and, uh, and that's our biggest problem is getting younger guys interested in it. So it's ironic, a situation where we have high unemployment yet a talent shortage. Yeah, you, oh yeah, we can't find it. The, uh, I think most of unemployment is people without a skill. And, uh, and uh, the country needs skilled people badly and there's thousands of jobs available for that and good jobs, you know. And uh, our policy here is uh, you guys can get as much education as you want and we'll help along with that. If you want to go to the technical school, learn a higher skill, get higher up, I don't care what it is, we'll back that up and help fund that. As opposed to so many kids now, I think in our country, everybody thinks you got to go to college, you know, or the parents think they're kids. They come out of there with a liberal arts degree in philosophy or some damn thing like that. And a company can't make any money on that. I don't know how to sell philosophy or what we do with it. You know? Not a big market for that. So, so that they can't find a job. You know? Come from uh, humble roots to a business that's now global in scale in 50 countries. Tell us a little bit about that journey and maybe some of the challenges that you encountered along the way of building what's a very large business now. It ain't easy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think anything is easy. There's, uh, everything is difficult in a way, you know. If it's really easy, there's something wrong, you know. I don't think there is any easy path to glory or whatever. I, I kind of call life is, a, is like climbing up a, a mountain or a hill and it's, it's full of cow pies all the way up. <laughs> and what you try and do is 
dance through the cow pies without stepping into them. But once in a while you do, then you just shake off your boots and keep climbing, you know? If you ever go through a recession in your main business, if you're just concentrating in one area, and that goes into the tank, uh, like the way we got hit, the minute uh, a thing like a recession hits and people are now penny pinching to basically live, the first thing they stop is buying this kind of stuff that we were making. Within three days of their crash in 2008, I think we lost almost 60% of our business. It was just, wow. orders were being canceled so fast you couldn't believe it. We were just staggering, and you know, what to do. And, um, <clears throat> but like I say, again, this is where you depend upon your people. We had such great people that we finally had gotten it kind of together and said, guys, here's what we got to do to save the company. And everybody took a hit in their salaries, their pay. My brother and I, I just said, hey, give me a little money for a little wine, a little food, and I'm fine, <laughs> you know. And everybody did that. Yeah. We did have some layoffs, about 25, but out of 200, that wasn't too bad. But we got through it, but it was our people and everybody worked together like, like hell, and, and uh, we slowly started coming back, getting through it. And uh, a year later, you know, we decided that we got to get very lean uh, in manufacturing. We got to get efficient. We're not going to run to Asia to get our stuff made. We want it made in the U.S. So we ended up designing this building and in, uh, in the process. In, the efficiency and the speed of production and uh, everything, communication uh, here and, and doing really the whole process under one big roof and having everybody together is really working. So we're becoming much more efficient, we're becoming more profitable. Before 2008, we used to hire bodies when we needed to get more production out. No more. We get more out of the people we got and at a higher level. So, so how did you learn how to do this, John, and how long have you been here at Harkin? Uh, I've been here at Harkin for five years now. Um, and I learned how to machine at technical college. I went through a two-year tool and die program. And from there, they gave me a broad experience of every aspect of machining. And it just so happens I ended up on the mill here. The technical schools are uh, a great process for that. Come on, get into this. This is interesting. You're doing something besides just sitting at a computer that's not producing anything, actually. You know? You're know, you actually going to end up making a product. And, and it's not really an iPhone app, is it? Yeah, no. <laughs> and you'll get a, uh, and, and they'll have a job bang like that because uh, there's so many available and there's not enough talent to go around. And you have it for life. And it'll keep improving all the time. Yeah, technology is always progressing. Um, I'm always learning every day uh, with trying to keep up with the technology. So this, is, this isn't the end for me. So I'm just glad to be a part of it. Other advice you might offer to someone who is perhaps uh, getting to the point where they're exiting high school and looking at life ahead and trying to figure out what yeah. to do? Don't be afraid to try different things. There's nothing wrong with failing in something you started and it didn't work out. Don't, don't let that get you down. Go ahead and give it a shot of something you really believe in and uh, give it a whack. And I mean a hard whack. Persevere like heck until everything falls through on it. And then say, all right, that was a great adventure, and uh, you got a bunch of bumps in the head. <clears throat> and again, I said, uh, that's a cow pie you stepped into, and, and uh, get on to the next one, you know? <laughs> I learned that from my dad, uh, <clears throat> and I think both my brother and I did. And actually, I really give credit to our parents as how we got to this point. Uh, they were of that Second World War generation, which they call the greatest generation, you know? And my father was interned in a, uh, camp, a prison camp in Indonesia until the end of the war. So those camps were very bad. Uh, the attrition rate was 70%, really terrible, you know. 
but he was a pretty tough guy, and uh, he managed. But anyway, when we got <coughs> reunited in San Francisco, I can still remember his words, you know. He just said, well, after all the hugging and the crying and the kissing, and uh, he just said, well, war is hell, life's not always fair, let's get on with it. And he refused Japanese reparations later on, because we lost everything again in Indonesia. And, um, and he said, start over, ground zero, boom. And he always did that, never looked back. My mother was the same way. And I think they instilled that in us. I think that's why we made it, because they, they pounded that into us. Just get on with it. So what if you get hit? Talk a little bit about how you, you reach out to customers. And, and Number one, you got to make a good product. Don't, don't chintz on the product. Um, let's make sure it's really well made for the price point that you're going to sell it at, regardless. And if you can't sell, if you can't get it down to that cheap, and it's going to become junky, then Jesus, don't make it. You know, don't turn out junk. I think you go out and you 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 don't. BS to the public about exaggerate your product. I think you tell the public the truth. And when you're doing that, you're slowly building your brand, your name of the product. The public likes it. And then if you treat them right, customer service, you back it up if he has a problem. Do not let a mechanical voice answer the phone. And I don't care if I become a multi-billion dollar company with a hundred thousand people around the world. <laughs> Whenever someone calls into the company, there will be a human voice there and saying, how can I help you? It's just learning right from wrong. That's, that's all we do here. We make decisions right from wrong, you know? And uh, by God, carry that right on through no matter how big you are. And I think you just get better and better and more successful. So maybe just one last question. Is there any one thing that sticks out in your mind as either most rewarding or the biggest lesson learned that you think is worthwhile for others to, to sort of understand? And, and you know, I'm 76, okay? And I, I've been constantly asked, why haven't you retired yet? You know, what your friends that age have and so on. Because well, I really like coming here. I like going downstairs and bantering with the people and my most fun is going down in the machine shop and John with the guys down there, or going into assembly and John with those people and so on. Uh, so the most rewarding thing is, I think, being surrounded by a great group, group of people and watching them grow from their wild days, single people, you know, raising hell and so on, to finally getting married, kids, kids going to school, going to college, and uh, just watching that growth and, uh, and our people grow, um, that's fun. You know, that's a lot of fun to see that. And to me, that was the most rewarding thing. Uh, it's not the money you make, you know. I, yeah, it's great, you know. It's good, I mean, you need that to get stuff and so on, but how much stuff do you need, you know? I don't, I don't need to drive two cars at one time. I don't need to have two or three houses or all of that stuff. That's, I call that stuff, you know. But uh, interacting with good people and everything, you can't buy that. I want to thank you yeah. and congratulate you for building a great company, and I wish only the best for you and for Harkin. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Well, I got the answer to my question. The business of Harkin depends on talent, on the shop floor, and in all the other roles necessary to run a global business. Peter can find that in southeastern Wisconsin, hence, his decision to locate here. Join us next time when we take Peter Harkin along to meet the next featured CEO so they can share their experiences and their expertise with each other and with you. Have a good day. Trade Secrets has been brought to you by the law firm of Ruder Ware and by the Judd S. Alexander Foundation.